addition to this committee. Congressman Chart. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here. <clears throat> and I must quickly say that I as a head of uh, Resources for the Future, it's an independent think tank, nonpartisan, uh, non-lobbying uh, organization, and the people in it are a lot smarter than I am. Uh, and so these are strictly my uh, comments from my experience and uh, on, on a variety of commissions as well as here in the uh, House of Representatives. Let me quickly say my plan is just to provide a few contextual things about where we are in uh, public policy on energy as well as where the markets are. Um, this committee, many of you are way ahead on these issues and this is probably not particularly relevant, uh, but I think it's very important in the public discussion that we try to get a better perspective on what really goes on with energy policy and with our markets. Uh, <clears throat> let me say, obviously, as everyone here knows, energy is absolutely essential to our modern uh, economy and to any economic growth that we want to have. It also has implications for our national security and it also has consequences for health, safety and the environment. And our practical problem is there is no policy, there is no set of policies that will serve all of these goals, so we're always in conflict and it comes right here into this committee and everywhere else over it. And frankly, the American people and others should reduce some of their expectations about what can be accomplished and how it can all fit together logically. This is a vast country, this is a vast problem, and we're going to come at it over time in many different ways. Let me uh, quickly uh, indicate, however, that while there are many things that we've done and tried and some failed and some worked, it, it's very important to remember that one of the fundamentals about our energy policy, which is true through Democratic and Republican administrations and Congresses, is that we rely overwhelmingly on private capital to build, produce, and distribute uh, uh, our energy in this country. And nobody that uh, I'm aware of wants to stop doing that. And what that means is it's a major challenge to what the government can actually efficiently do because you're always trying to change, incentivize, or restrict behavior by investors or by um, consumers. And many of the initiatives that are taken do not pay off because they involve m millions of decisions by consumers and thousands of decisions by investors that have something uh, under pressures and other uh, values at stake. With this limitation in mind, nonetheless, there are, not, there are many things that do work and do mm. help. Mm. But let me uh, quickly uh, do a piece of the picture that the chairman already outlined, which is our picture on energy continually changes, and we have a new picture today compared to where we were 10 years ago, and it's very important that we recognize uh, this change, partly to recognize it's going to continue to change, and policy has to accept and work through those changes. First, we have a vast array of new technologies that have come into the marketplace in this decade. I don't care whether it's in oil production, gas production, solar, uh, nuclear, or uh, efficiencies and technologies and vehicles. It is amazing. And most of it was not predicted to happen by academics, by industry, or by a government when the turn of the century came about. Uh, many of these things were quite well known, but nobody expected them to take hold the way they did. Second of all, we have a radical change in our supply of natural gas and the projected supply of natural gas, again, unanticipated at the beginning of the decade. Third, we have a decline, again, under predicted and, uh, in our oil imports, uh, which is viewed as very positive from a security standpoint, with a projection that it will continue if we don't mess it up. Fourth, we have a, a actually decline in our carbon dioxide emissions uh, uh, in this system with a projected minimal growth over the next decade. This is a positive development. Some of it, of course, is just the consequences of the uh, unfortunate slowdown in the economy. But others represent actually uh, improvements in efficiencies and fuel switching and other things that have gone on. More to be done, in the view of many people on this front, but these, this is progress. Now, why did this happen? Let's remember the power of price at the outset because we almost always want to deny it in public conversations in this country. First, we had a very high rise in natural gas prices at the turn of the century, less than a decade ago. It was followed within a few years by a very high rise in oil prices. And by the way, again, neither academics, the government, nor uh, uh, the industry predicted, uh, a few individuals probably did, but they ended up to write their books and get rich after the fact. Whether they actually knew it ahead of time is not clear. Uh, the, the truth is that had a powerful impact on the behavior of consumers, investors, and, and government policy. 
Second of all, obviously the entrepreneurial risks that people are willing to take, like Mr. Ham uh, and, uh, and others, have been powerful, whether it's in oil, in the new natural gas supply, in the new nuclear uh, plant that is about to be built in this country, uh, in solar, in, in a whole bunch of uh, resources. We require that entrepreneurialism across the board if we're going to be effective. Nobody in this group, I'm sure, uh, would deny the importance of that. Third uh, reason for this change is because many of these technologies that came in the marketplace for production or for demand reduction were actually the result of decades of research, some of it by the private sector, much of it supported in some level by the public sector, some of it in public sector like our national laboratories. It's very hard to unsort that mix of which is which, but nobody should misunderstand that both are important and government policy and government expenditure uh, helped advance these technologies that now are, we've sucked into the marketplace. And the fourth finding, there of course have been policies at state and federal level that have helped incentivize, and this, uh, this committee itself uh, has been very active uh, in that, helped us in both the efficient technologies and promoted adoption in the marketplace. Many of these policies, I would suggest to you, actually followed on the price increases that drove the incentives for the marketplace as well as the political incentive uh, for Congress and others to make decisions. Now, let me suggest to you that um, while this picture is, is a, a, in my view, a very positive development compared to where we were 10 years ago, obviously it was marred this past in the last couple of years by that massive blowout uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and marred by uh, the, the events at Fukushima. These are high-risk uh, operations. We are in a position around the world where we do things big. We're going to be taking big risks, and we have to be smart about how to mitigate those to the extent we can. I am not one who thinks we can just walk away from all these risks, but I do think we have a serious responsibility, uh, governments and industry, to uh, minimize uh, their impact. Now, this new natural gas supply is the overwhelming development uh, in our energy picture that was certainly unanticipated. And I per many people believe, and I certainly believe, this is a powerful economic benefit to this country. But we cannot mistake that there are major challenges in this development and that have got to be taken seriously, whether they are impacts on air, on uh, methane leakage, on water. Uh, and some in industry are being extremely responsible about this, and frankly, some are not. We have many players in this uh, new and dynamic uh, field. And government has to be smart and careful in the way it regulates, but we have to take seriously, as the National Petroleum Council a uh, study of last summer makes very clear this is a, a very much of an industry along with other NGOs and others involved in this. It's a federal advisory committee, as you folks well know, um, which said you've got to have responsible development. You've got to take these issues seriously uh, for us to be able to capitalize and maintain a good uh, Thing. The other, there are other challenges. Oh, oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I will, I will stop with one more challenge, and that is this is not just changing the natural gas picture. This is changing the picture of all other major energy sources in this country. And as you make policy, you need to think through what's going to be undermined and what's not by this e enormous uh, development. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. No problem. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Congressman. Dr. Jorgensen, you're next. Uh, as the chairman has told you, uh, I'm a professor at Harvard University. Uh, I've taught in the Department of Economics there since 1969. I devoted a good part of my relatively lengthy career as an economist to the topics that we are here to debate today. And it's a very great privilege for me to participate in this panel and to join you in your deliberations. I would like to discuss three issues. To fix ideas, I'm going to associate a number with each one of them. And the first number that I'd like you to remember is 1.5% of the GDP. What is this? A system of environmental taxes on fossil fuel combustion would generate revenues equal to 1.5% of the GDP. This would be mainly a very substantial tax on coal, a much more limited tax on oil, and a minimal tax on natural gas. There would be no taxes on renewable forms of energy like wind or solar. 
the 1.5 percent of the GDP does not, I want to emphasize, does not include any additional revenues from limiting or eliminating tax expenditures like the ones that you're going to hear about today. Let me then proceed to the second issue that I'd like to discuss. That's the federal government budget. You've been told by dozens of economists inside and outside the government that we'll be going off for over a fiscal cliff at the end of this calendar year. The Bush tax cuts of 2001 and 2003 are finally scheduled to sunset as we welcome in the new year. There's also the threat of sequestration, which was legislated by the Congress in August of last year. And beyond that looms another fight over the debt limit. <laughs> Douglas Elmendorf, the highly respected director of the Congressional Budget Office, has told you that all of this will produce another recession. So the number I'd like you to remember here is 2% of the GDP. This is the difference between the federal revenue of 17% of the GDP in 2011, which is the last year for which we have real numbers, and 19%, which is the long-term average of federal revenue in the GDP for the last 30 years. This is the minimum that I think we can expect that revenue will contribute to closing the budget gap that looms ahead of us. The third issue is comprehensive tax reform. Ranking member Hatch has reminded us that that is the subject of these hearings. The number there I'd like you to remember is seven trillion. To paraphrase that great U.S. Senator after whom this building is named, A trillion here and a trillion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. So what is the seven trillion? This is the cumulative impact of a carefully designed system for comprehensive tax reform. Seven trillion is more than sufficient when added to our national wealth of 60 trillion to put our labor force back to work and to resolve our fiscal crisis. In short, it would enable us to achieve a fiscal policy that is sustainable. Let me summarize. We're not here to debate energy policy alone. We're not here to debate comprehensive tax reform alone. We're not here to debate the federal government's budget alone. We're here to see how all three can be fitted together to solve our budget problem, to clean up our environment, and to give a positive thrust to the growth of our long ailing economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. In time, too. <laughs> Dr. Ham, Mr. Ham, we'll call you a doctor for now, Mr. Uh, Ham. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chairman Bacchus, Ranking Member Hatch, and members of the committee. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be here today. I'll be speaking on my own behalf, uh, not, not as representative of Continental Resources, nor I'm not here on behalf of the Romney campaign, for which I serve as an energy advisor. It's been 20 years since I was here speaking before this committee. Uh, Senator David Bourne at that time was co-chair of the committee, I believe, and spoke to him about a couple things that were mostly unknown, uh, totally unconventional at the time. Uh, one of them was horizontal drilling, and the other was the aspect of drilling into uh, the source rocks themselves, the shales, that we might produce a vast amount of uh, natural gas, and talking about a temporary trigger, tax trigger, to advance that uh, uh, theory. Well, that wasn't given. We didn't get a tax trigger, but over the last 20 years, we've seen those uh, technologies developed, and uh, thank God we've uh, come a long way since then. 
Continental is a top 10 uh, petroleum uh, liquids producer. We're 75 percent of oil with last year's uh, production. We focus on oil. You know, the Bakken play uh, center started in Montana, and uh, that's where we started with Am Cooley Field, and of course, you know, the deep end of the pools over in uh, Senator Conrad's uh, state over in North Dakota, and we were one of the original players over there. I might say that uh, um, only here in America can a 13th child, you know, a sharecropper turn of one man operation, one truck operation into the nation's largest oil companies. But having discovered that field at Continental, we've been able to do that. Today, I'm going to talk to you on perspective of that seasoned petroleum uh, geologist, explorationist that's been in this business, fine oil for my own count, for about 45 years. I first started speaking on the wall about two years ago. Uh, at that time, it was being uh, severely disparaged, and uh, people were trying to get market share. So I thought someone needs to stand up for oil, and I started talking about that. It's a very important segment of our energy picture. Nearly all transportation runs on it. There's hardly a jet plane anywhere that burns anything besides oil products. I'm also here to talk about these federal tax provisions uh, that will allow us to continue the job of the viable American dream of energy independence that we've begun. These are very important for America. You know, there's 18,000 independent producers today that drill 95% of the wells in America. We produce 67% of the oil, 86% of the natural gas that's produced today. We typically invest all that we make, borrow about 30% more, and I'm afraid our company falls in that same lot as well. Independents uh, are in the exploration and production business. That's what, that's what we do. We have no op refining operations, and I won't get into the tax consequences. Um, Senator Nichols covered that very well. Section uh, 199, foreign tax credits, could then affect us a whole lot. But certainly the IDCs uh, do, and if we do away with those, we'll start stop this march uh, to energy independence that we've begun. These same tax provisions not only allowed us to survive the terrible times, disastrous years of the 80s and 90s that eliminated about 50 percent of the independents within our ranks, but it also allows one other real important thing, and that allows us to try and fail and try again. And certainly that's what it took with the Bakken. We drilled about 18 uncommercial wells up there before breaking the code on, on producing this mighty oil field that's somewhere over 24 billion barrels. Without that ability, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And also talk about some other players. You know, the Barnett, George Mitchell quest down there. George worked 16 years breaking the code on the Barnett. This is the largest, oil, largest natural gas field today in Texas. Took 16 years to break the code to get that done. So try and try again, he is able to do it. I might just talk about a new era that we've entered into of American oil. You know, it's fair to say we're transcending from an era that was mobile. That oil moved. What we're entering into today is an immobile portion of the oil on Earth. And this is estimated to be at least a third larger than the mobile portion was that we've been producing in this world 160 years. We're now able to do that through one thing, and that is precision horizontal drilling. We're able to go down two miles, turn right, go two miles, and hit that lapel pin, uh, you know, with a, with a drill bit. That's that precision that we've developed. The independence largely uh, responsible for that development myself and others. And so we're able to do that precision drilling. And that's what unlocked uh, this new era that we're into. And it's certainly a, a great era. You know, we've had tremendous success in these new resource plays across the country. Uh, somebody aptly described the, the new natural gas supplies that we've unlocked. Some hundred years, I think it could be even greater than that. It's tremendous. 
and we've seen uh, you know the imports go down as as new production has come on here in America we've gone down to about 42 percent right now from 60 percent high of 60 percent we're down to 42 percent now and it's estimated uh, Marshall Atkins he's a renowned uh, analyst with Raymond James he uh, he's estimated that'll fall to 26 percent by 2015 that's just around the corner and also would cut our trade deficit by 82 percent by 2020. So it's tremendous where we're headed and what it's done. So, but mo most importantly, we've, uh, we're into a cheaper price regime as a discounted price regime for both oil and gas for the consumer. So lower cost to the consumers here in America. About $15 a barrel right now difference between us and Brent's price. And we're talking $2 natural gas here, and we're talking $12 natural gas in, in China today. So it's a tremendous difference.